Here we are. You need to train me on the difference of this so I can so I can really give people a talking to. So you don't look like a fool in front of entomologists. <laughs> are you ready? Yeah. So you're outside. You see some flowers. You see a fly or say a flying insect. Okay. Coming toward a blooming flower. Take note of a couple of things. One, how many wings does it have? Does it have one pair of wings or does it have two pair of wings? If it has two pairs of wings, then it's not a fly because a true fly, diptera, two wings in Greek, belongs to the hugely diverse and amazing order of true flies that have one pair of wings and then the hind wings have evolved to be these knobby gyroscopic balancing organs called haltiers. So you can even see those like on a crane fly, you have this crane fly, some people call them mosquito hawks, even though they have nothing, nothing to do with mosquitoes. And you can see with these little knobs on the ends. Those used to be evolutionarily hind wings. Flies have secondarily lost those hind wings. But on any member of the order Hymenoptera, which means married wings, you have a pair of front wings, a pair of hind wings, and they're married together by these little hooks called hamulae. And that's the synapomorphy, the shared derived character that defines the lineage of Hymenoptera, which include ants, bees, wasps, the subject of at least part of today, and saw flies. I, I feel like when something has so many wings, it's just like, I don't really need those it's a blur anymore. Of wings. Uh, okay. Like that's kind of showing off. I'll, I'll give you a few more. Is it hairy? Bees, and there are over 20,000 described species of bees on the planet, have hairy bodies. And not only that, a lot of them have forked hairs. And that increases the likelihood of them picking up proteinous pollen mm -hmm. from the anthers, the male reproductive parts of flowers. Mm -hmm. Because they're not predators, they're herbivores, they're vegetarians, and they get their protein source from pollen, which they pick up on their bodies. Oh, so they get their protein source from the pollen. I thought it was just a byproduct of going in and getting... No. So, so you can have, when, when it comes to bumblebees, honeybees, you can see on their hind legs these big sacks, these pollen sacks, these baskets carrying yellow, orange, a purplish, a red, a white, depends on what flowers they're collecting from. Mm. The pollen that they scrape off their bodies into these pollen baskets or sacks. And this is like someone not on a, at a buffet that's stuffing things in their purse. Yeah. <laughs> well, so picture, it's a pandemic. Yeah. We don't, we want to socially distance, right? We want to try to avoid going to a densely populated store, for example, a market. Good idea. So what do you do? Imagine if you could go to a flower and get everything you need, meaning you could get your protein source and your carbohydrates. Mm. So pollen from the anthers, and then put your tongue-like mouth parts down the corolla, the tube of the flower, and suck up or lap up the nectar, the sugary, sweet, with some amino acids, um, nectar. Convert that, including uh, at least 100 ingredients from your own body, to make honey. If we're a true bug, and I've told you in the past that all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. Yes. Because one order of insects are the true bugs. And they have, they're defined by, again, the synapomorphy, the shared derived character that evolutionarily defines this group, is a piercing sucking mouth part called a proboscis. And that's all they have. Hmm. Sticks out, pierces into you, or pierces into a flower. Hmm. An assassin bug wants to suck your blood, or a cicada, or say an aphid wants to suck the phloem from a plant, right? Mm -hmm. But in the case of a honeybee, it's so much more. They've got transversely chomping mandibles, right? They've got a pair of maxillae with palps that have contact chemoreceptors for taste. And then they have labia with labial palps below. Now what they can do is they can chew their food or chew wax, for example, 
that they produce from their own bodies. Or they can stick out these tongue-like mouth parts to suck up the nectar. Hmm. Amazing. I had a professor at George I Court who said that insects' mouth parts are like a full silverware set. Knife, fork, spoon, all in one. Depends who you are. Like, for example, if you're a dragonfly immature, which is aquatic, they'll have these retractable and extensible mouth parts called a labial mask. It's from that third set of mouth parts, a labium, right? And what they do is lightning speed. They shoot out this labial mask. So here you are, audience, and right? They shoot it out and it can be spoon shaped. It can have the tines of a fork and it can even have serrated edges. And they grab their food and bring it in very quickly. Whew, evolution. One way you can really uh, define lineages and distinguish insects as a total amateur in the field. You think, oh, there are over a million described species of insects in at least 25 orders, right? And uh, so many families, it's overwhelming. But once you learn a few different key features, you can begin to competently, confidently and competently distinguish and categorize. Hmm. And the hymenopter versus flies, that's a big one. The mouth parts for the true bugs, that's a big one. So you can look at mouth parts alone. And that's pretty easy to do if you're comfortable with looking closely at an insect or picking it up and looking at it. And you can see lots of beautiful things hmm. that distinguish them.